Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, welcome back to another video and today it's another Witch Wednesdays and we are going to be looking at the full love story of the couple Cornelia and Caleb from the Witch TV series. Specifically the TV series rather than the comic because they are very very different relationships um, in each medium. So um, today we are looking specifically at the TV show iteration of uh, the couple. Now if you've watched any of my witch videos or ship related content you'll know by now that Cornelia and Caleb are my favourite fictional couple of all time. They have been ever since I was like nine when I first started watching the show so there is a degree of self-indulgence here I'll be honest. I can't uh, pretend that I'm not really excited to just sit here and talk to you about my favourite couple but I am planning to do a series of videos covering the various relationships in witch so um, I will be doing one on Will and Matt, uh, Nigel and Sharani, Helen and Eric, and I would like to do one about the comic book relationships as well, although um, that's going to take a bit longer because I don't have all that information just right up here in the old noggin, whereas I do the, the show, I, I, you know, the information is all very, very much stored up here, but we'll take a bit more research with the comics. But I am planning to do them because I find the witch relationships really interesting. I think the show really did so well with a lot of the relationships so I would like to, to do a dive into each of them but um, I wanted to start with my favourite and the one that definitely has the most content to go through just by virtue of the fact that Caleb is a main character in his own right so he has a lot more screen time than like say Nigel or Eric so there's a lot to go through here this video is going to be in multiple parts as of yet I don't know how many but when I uh, put the script through one of those how long is my speech going to be um things uh yeah considerable length so I'm just going to go ahead and record and I'll figure out in the editing stage how when and where I'm going to split the parts so just go with me on this one I promise though I will try not to turn into a big messy fangirl while I'm reading this script even when we do have to cover the breakup arc in season two Oh, that bloodshed, curtains and clover The bombs were closing my hair What's the one you reach for? All throughout the great war No, this is an essay and I'm an academic, so we are taking this seriously. But first, let's introduce the players in this ship. So on one side we have Cornelia Hale. She is 13 years old at the start of the series. She lives in a penthouse uh, in an apartment complex called the Garden Plaza in the city of Heatherfield. It's an affluent apartment block. She comes from wealth. Uh, she likes shopping, skating and sarcasm. Her family is quite rich. Her father owns a bank so she certainly has uh, expectations about how life should be and where she wants her life to go. Um, but at heart she is a loving girl, a caring friend. She has a lot of passion. She is uh, a very sweet person overall. Unless you piss her off in which case you will regret it. And on the other side we have Caleb. Caleb no last name. Whether Caleb canonically has a last name or not is a discussion for another video, uh, specifically uh, this one. Uh, he is 15 years old and he's from the planet of Meridian and he is the leader of the rebellion against their tyrannical ruler Prince Phobos. He begins the series as an orphan and his life of poverty and oppression in Meridian really couldn't be further from Cornelia's life of wealth and privilege on earth. Uh, he's stubborn, determined and selfless and will happily throw himself into the line of fire for anyone and anything and is pretty much in a life-threatening situation on a daily basis. On paper these two sound like polar opposites, two people who would never make sense together, one who was raised in poverty on a world that is pretty medieval and another who was raised in wealth and privilege in an affluent city on earth with technology and aspirations and you know who actually has hopes for the future as opposed to someone who lives in a world where there may no there may be no future depending on you know the outcome of the war but in reality there's a lot more that unites Cornelia and Caleb than divides them and we'll soon see that actually they are made for each other. <laughs> so now we know who we're dealing with, let's get into it. Cornelia and Caleb don't actually meet until the second episode of the series but there is a moment in episode one that I think is worth mentioning. 
So in the first episode, Cornelia and her friends discover that they have been chosen as the new Guardians of the Veil, vale, which is the entire point of the show, as I'm sure you've gathered. Meanwhile, in Meridian, Caleb has just heard a rumour that the true heir to the Meridian throne is alive and living on Earth, so he plans to cross the Veil vale in search of them. The girls are down by the river trying out their new powers when a portal opens and a person comes hurtling through and crashes into the bins. And that person is, of course, Caleb. The girls try to close the portal before Cedric can drag Caleb back to, through to Meridian, but they don't know what to do and they're too late, which leads to this moment. You lost him! That thing got him! I just think it's interesting that Cornelia is so distressed about losing Caleb, a person she doesn't know and has seen for all of about 15 seconds, not realising the importance that he will have in her life in the very near future. And I always wonder if she just felt some instant connection to this person, even though she doesn't really know who he is at all at this point. You know, she was really concerned about the fact that, that they didn't manage to save him. And maybe she's just concerned because he's a human being and, you know, getting captured by a big snake monster. Or maybe she felt some connection to this person and is genuinely upset about the loss of him. In episode 2, the girls go to Meridian in search of Will, who has been captured, and this is where they all first meet Caleb. Will was imprisoned with Caleb and Blanc at the bottom of an oubliette, and this is what brings all of the team together for the first time. And Cornelia's first reaction to seeing Caleb up close is... That's what you get for trusting a smuggler. Oh, Who are you again? He's the rebel leader. You're the rebel leader? Yeah. Is he cute or what? Which is then followed by this comment from Helen. So do you have a girlfriend? Because I think Cornelia likes you. So we see that Cornelia is physically attracted to Caleb, but of course she doesn't know anything about him as a person yet. But for her, there's definitely something about him that intrigues her. The girls are mad at Caleb for most of the key, and Cornelia's getting hit on by Aldar, and so we'll just skip on to episode four, Happy Birthday Will. In this episode, Cornelia is planning a birthday party for Will, and since Caleb is still learning about Earth customs, Cornelia and Helen take him to the mall to teach him about parties, which is where we get this classic scene. So Caleb, you are going to learn all about parties. We have parties in Meridian. To celebrate the end of Clunderfeast, we cook and eat an ox. We won't be doing that. Hey girls! Party Friday, 5 o'clock, Irma's house. It's Will's birthday. It's a surprise. So don't tell Will or Irma. But you said it's like Irma's house. <laughs> well, that's what makes it a surprise. <laughs> They're not even roasting an ox. <gasps> hey, how come Kurt Clubber and me didn't get invited to this party of yours? Because I'm not inviting creeps. Oh, I'm sorry. Creeps, Caleb. Caleb, creeps. Pleased to meet you. Are you related? I say we teach them a lesson. Remember that horror movie where the kids are terrified by guys in masks? Where are we gonna find scary guys in masks? Oh. <laughs> Those are your tough guys? I'd like to see them last one second in a Skuldorian scream cage. Caleb, you're a guest in this dimension. You can't go all rebel leader on us. Promise me. Oh, he's so cute when he sulks. <laughs> we get the impression from this scene that Cornelia and Caleb have built up a friendship since he arrived on Earth. Since one, he agreed to go to the mall with her. Two, they're chatting like they're friends. And three, she feels confident enough to ask him to make her a promise. And Caleb does stick to this promise. Mostly. Even if he does talk about it at the time. At the party, Cornelia expresses jealousy when Elion and Alchemy show interest in Caleb. Hi, remember me from the mall? Alchemy? Remember me too? I'm Elion. Caleb from the mall. Back off, girls. Stick with me or they'll tear you to pieces. And then she complains when she has to leave him with them to go and close the portal. Yeah, scales are pretty sharp. 
the world had better be in serious danger for me to leave Caleb with those girls. So clearly she has feelings for him and wants to keep him away from the other girls, even Elion, who is her best friend. She doesn't want to share him with her best friend, she wants him for herself. <laughs> Caleb realises that the girls are gone and assumes, correctly, that there must be trouble, so him and Blunk head out after them. At City Hall, Caleb sees Sheffield's discount bad boys Kurt, Uriah and Clubber up to no good, and he tells Blunk that he can't do anything to them because of the promise he made to Cornelia, which I think is really significant. He hasn't known her all that long, but he already feels like he can't break a promise to her, presumably because he cares about how she would react if he did, you know? He would hurt her feelings if he broke her promise. The fact that he then uses the loophole of sending Blunk in instead is irrelevant, Sharp. Later, Cornelia expresses concern for Caleb's welfare when he's fighting Cedric, and get used to Cornelia screaming Caleb's name. It happens a lot in this show. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb! I hope this works better than it did in practice. On the way back to the party, Cornelia does her magic hair flip thing on Caleb's face and then grabs his arm and drags him back into the party, further confirming that they have a bond of some description and clearly feel very comfortable with each other. Who wouldn't? I mean, we are kick butt cute. Ay. There's a very brief moment in this episode. I mean, there isn't really very much to say other than also get used to these two bickering because that also happens a lot in this show. More stairs? Don't you have like some kind of stone escalator? Girls. There's also this hilarious moment later on in the episodes. Where did he buy? Glue. Glue for what? Glue to stick on his realistic rubber human face! Uh. In the labyrinth, Cornelia intercedes to save Caleb from Sniffer and offers him a lift to the portal, which he refuses, but in fairness he doesn't really like flying at the start of the series. Cornelia and the other girls express their gratitude to the Meridianites for helping them earlier in the episode, and Caleb says that they'll have plenty of chances to repay them. And that's really all we have for the labyrinth. <laughs> Moving on now to Divide and Conquer, Sheffield Institute has organised a ski trip which the girls have no real interest in going on because none of them actually like skiing, until a new girl shows up and starts sniffing around Will's crush, Matt Olson, leading to Will deciding that they all are going on the ski trip. Clearly the girls did not learn from Boy Meets World that nothing good ever happens on the school ski trip, but there we go. The group are discussing this in the Silver Dragon basement and we get this lovely scene. It's a little something called fun. Don't be too hard on him, Irma. He doesn't have that in his world. I know what fun is. I have it all the time. <laughs> oh, really? So what do you do to get down and get crazy? Plan a rebellion in a red nose and clown shoes? Mm -hmm. Again, we get a sense of the bond that Caleb has built, not just with the girls, but with Cornelia in particular, since she's making fun of him and puts a silly cat hat on his head and he just sits there and takes it. But of course, being the proud loser he is, Caleb shows up at the ski lodge, determined to prove that he can, in fact, have fun. And then completely eat shit when he tries to ski on Yanlin skis that... He look like they served Genghis Khan back in China. But then a cool dude offers him a snowboard, and Caleb realises that it's the same as mumboarding. Alright, ready to have fun. Skis are for losers. You want this. Ha! A mummer board. You didn't tell me it's like mum boarding. Do that. Mumboarding. You do it 
on Mud Slides. The reason I bring any of this up is really just because Cornelia is watching this entire thing play out and her facial expressions vary from embarrassment to horror to amazement and it's just really funny getting to see how she reacts to Caleb's, uh, this whole thing, you know, embarrassment when he falls over, uh, and then, like, amazement when she realises that he actually can snowboard. It, it, it's just fun to watch her reacting. There isn't much to say about Ambush at Taurus Felney because Caleb and the girls are fighting for most of this episode. Uh, so, you know, we don't really get much uh, cute moments. But there are these brief moments where Cornelia and Will are carrying Caleb and one of them, he has his arm around her waist. So I'm including that. Return of the Tracker is a really significant episode in the development of Cornelia and Caleb's relationship because it's the first time that we get any inclination from Caleb that he actually has feelings for Cornelia. We know that she likes him but he's never given any indication of how he feels about her but it becomes clear during this scene. There's a lot here so I'm just going to post it and you can watch. Oh, you just haven't tried broccoli the way I make it, Vance Michael. I didn't know you and the poster were dating. <gasps> Caleb! Sneaking up on people might be okay, Meridian, but here it's just, like, rude. I don't get why girls here fall for a picture of a guy pretending to be an elf. He is not an elf. He's a Trendelblatten, a tribe of incredibly good-looking pixies who bravely battle the forces of Flundar. Hey, I'd like to see Vance Michael watch his teeth tangle with a giant lizard, cause, cause I do that, you know, every day. Clearly, Caleb is jealous that Cornelia is fawning over an actor playing a warrior when he is a warrior, and as far as he's concerned, she isn't fawning over him because he's an oblivious doofus and hasn't picked up on any of the signs in the past eight episodes or however long it's been. Okay, so this scene is kind of wonky because it has one of which season one's infamous voice mix-ups. Tarani's voice makes a comment about how Caleb needs help, but the line is clearly supposed to be from Cornelia because Hey Lynn then makes fun of Cornelia for saying it, saying that she thinks that she likes Caleb, to which Cornelia retorts, Fine, I'll save Caleb from the tracker, but that doesn't mean I like him. She then flies down to Caleb and comments that his antics are very Michael Justin of you, which Honestly, I don't know if he would take that as a compliment or an insult, but never mind. <laughs> Near the end of the episode, Cornelia's protesting is clearly in vain because it's obvious she likes Caleb when she panics after he disappears through the portal with the tracker. Caleb! We've got to seal it! Give him another second! It's sweet because she turns to Will, who refuses to close the portal while Caleb is still through it, and whether that's out of loyalty to Cornelia or Caleb, it's still a really nice moment. In this episode, which lose their powers and become stuck in their guardian forms due to hijinks, they go to Caleb to see if he knows what's going on and he is a complete dick, to be honest. I don't know why he acts like this, but never mind. Here's the moment. So you came to me for help. That was smart. Real smart. Now if only you were smart. Real smart. Yeah. Hey, you love birds. Knock it off. We need all the help we can get. This always cracks me up because neither Cornelia or Caleb actually acknowledge Will's comment about them being lovebirds and they still don't realise that they have crushes on each other even when their friends are calling them lovebirds to their face. They are idiots. Anyway, Caleb goes on to say this shit. Yeah, so there I was, mining a project at three. I remember because I saved the beautiful daughter of the Threebian Lord. I was surrounded by a three-headed Trifurachimus. Focus. Right. I hate them both. They're idiots. <laughs> This episode includes a very memorable scene for Cornelia and Caleb and you really need the entire scene for context and it's lengthy so let's just watch it first. So what do I do? I cut the ropes and I swing, shoot, <laughs> magnificently right into the open portal. Then you skid magnificently across 50 feet of paved road. Now, careful. Sorry, Mr. Brave Hero. <laughs> Guys, guys, guess what? Wow, what 
What happened to you? Standard hero injuries. Huh. Anyway, Elian got a guy. A guy? Who? Who? She didn't tell me. Well, it just happened. This guy, Brian, he's a dog walker. They met when a Pomeranian stopped to sniff her ankle. Well, is that cute or what? Nobody ever sniffs my ankle. Good for Elian. She's been so unhappy since she dumped Mark. She dumped a guy so she's unhappy? Well, duh. She didn't have a boyfriend. <laughs> Well, duh, yourself. She had a boyfriend until she dumped him. Guess we're a little backward in Meridian. We only ask people out we actually like. <laughs> so, what's taking him so long with Corny? So much. There's just so much going on here. It's Cornelia cleaning his wounds, her calling him Mr. Brave Hero, and that voice. Caleb talking about how on Meridian they ask out people they actually like. And then, of course, the magical, brightly lit looking at each other moments with the heartbeat sound effects. Like, the writers were crazy for this. BRB, I'm calling Andrew and Daryl and asking what they were doing here. And, of course, Will is once again speaking for the entire fandom, asking why Caleb hasn't asked out Cornelia yet when they are so clearly besotty with each other. He's already saying, you know, I'm ready and we ask out people we like. And Will's like, okay, well then why aren't you asking out Cornelia since the two of you are clearly obsessed? Later in the episode, Cornelia's having lunch with Elion, and we get this funny little scene with Caleb as their waiter. What'll it be, ladies? Caleb, right? You're working here? I'm actually raising money to help <gasps> fight. Gingivitis! His father's a crusading dentist. You know, in retrospect, this scene is actually kind of weird because, uh, as far as anyone knows, Caleb's father's dead, so Cornelia making a joke about being a crusading dentist is actually kind of harsh. But, I mean, she was on the spot, so we'll let her away with it. The Princess Revealed is one of the most important episodes of the entire series, plot-wise, because this is when Witch, Caleb, Yanlim, Blunk, and everyone all found out that Elion is actually the heir to the throne that Phobos has been looking for all season. And Cornelia is obviously devastated by this because Elion is her best friend in the world, and the last thing that she wants is for her to be the sister of Phobos. And Caleb tries his best to come for her. I don't believe it! I've known Elion all my life. She is my best friend. Phobos sister, the heir to the Meridian throne, was brought to Earth over 12 years ago. Elion was born right here in Heatherfield Memorial. How does she know that? I am not fighting her. I don't care who she is. We have a job to do. What, betraying our friends? Ugh. And if she is this evil princess, why haven't the bad guys just taken her? I really like this little scene because we get to see how much Caleb cares about Cornelia. He can see that she's in pain. He's trying to softly reason with her. And then when he realizes that she's too upset, she, he just puts his hand on her shoulder. It's really sweet. He cares and he just wants her to, you know, not be sad. And it's really nice. <laughs> Uh, there's a blink and you'll miss it moment in this episode where Cornelia is holding Caleb's arm and it's in there, so I'm including it. Shut up. There we go. Now, the plot of the mud slug centers around Cornelia leaving the group due to her blaming Will and the others by extension for Elion choosing to go to Meridian in the previous episode. For context, Cornelia had been saying since the princess revealed that they had to tell Elion the truth because they're her friends and they owe it to her to tell her who she really is. But Will thought that by doing that, they risk pushing Elion further away because she would freak out and that might just make her easier to manipulate by Cedric and Phobos. And the other girls ended up agreeing with Will. Ultimately, though, part of the reason why Elion was so keen to leave and go to Meridian was because she realised that her friends knew the truth about her and didn't tell her, which just made her feel more alienated from her life on Earth and pushed her into going back to Meridian to be with her brother. So Cornelia was right all along. They should have told Elion the truth. Cornelia's out walking when Caleb spots her and we get this scene. You're listening to another four in a row of slow. Very slow music here on Heatherfield's sad Cornelia. song station. Ow! Ow! Look, Cornelia, about telling Elion, um, Will was wrong, okay? People can be wrong. Me and the other rebels disagree. We fight, but we always pull it together for the cause. Well, I'm rebelling against our cause. The people of Meridian need you. They have my best friend. 
They don't need me. This is the only time in the early part of this episode that Cornelia actually talks to any of the group. And she does smile when Caleb comes up to her, which kind of suggests that she's not mad at him. And that makes sense because, as far as I can recall, he never voiced an opinion on the whole telling Elion thing. He doesn't know Elion very well, so I think he was just staying out of it because it's not really his call who, you know, what they should do about Elion when he's not remotely close to her. So he's not really at fault here, which is probably why Cornelia is still willing to talk to him, even though she won't talk to anyone else. But Caleb clearly wants Cornelia back in the group. He tries really hard to convince her to come back and says that the people of Meridian need her. And who is a person of Meridian? That's right, Caleb. He's saying that he needs her. He's, he's trying to cover up. He's saying people of Meridian, but he means himself. Okay, I don't actually think that's what the writers meant by that line, but you know what? You don't know, so it could be. <laughs> Caleb returns to the Silver Dragon and we get this cracker of a line. I just saw Cornelia. She's hiding out listening to girl music. Oh, she just needs some time. <gasps> she needs better taste in music. Caleb joins the rest of the girls and Blunk and looking for Cornelia and he's ultimately the one who figures out that she'll be listening to music because the last time he saw her she was listening to music. Which gives Will the idea to get in contact with Cornelia through the radio. Towards the end of the episode Cornelia uses her powers to trap the mud slug and it takes most of her energy and we get this lovely moment of Caleb being adorable. <laughs> Again, we see just how much Caleb cares about her. They aren't a couple yet at this point, but he obviously just feels the need to come for her after everything she's been through in the past few days. And she leans into it, clearly appreciating the hug. And I don't know how these two haven't realised they're in love at this point, because, I mean, look at them. Like, that looks pretty in love to me, but, <laughs> you know, they, they, they still don't get it. This is just, you know, friends being friends. And I mean, friends can hug, let's be serious. Like, my friends hug me if I was upset and had just expelled all of my power to trap a mud slug my friends would hug me too but I'm just saying there's nothing about this that's platonic <laughs> The skill dance is coming up and the girls all need dates and Cornelia, being the overconfident bad bitch that I always wish I could be, just walks up to Caleb while he's dripping wet, wipes his face and tells him that he's taking her to the dance and needs to pick her up at seven. Good, you're all here. Big news. We heard dance Friday night and you say... Uh, Cedric's using rebels to build his giant drill? No, you're taking me. Oh. I'll be ready at seven. Oh, and don't wear those yucky boots. She's an icon. The rest of this episode is about Heatherfield residents being hypnotised and honestly this episode is hilarious. <laughs> the marching band group ditching school lives rent free in my brain forever. There are a couple of little moments in this episode. Uh, one is when Cornelia gets annoyed at Caleb for not thanking them for their help. And then later in the episode she calls out to Caleb and Blunk when they're pretending to be hypnotised. And at the end of the episode though Caleb really does take Cornelia to the dance although she does storm off in a huff because he's a bad dancer. <laughs> Sometimes these two make me want to die. And trust me, this is mild compared to some of the other episodes. It's going to get so much worse. <laughs> Ghost of Elion is one of the episodes where Caleb is in full dish mode and I hadn't quite noticed it until I was actually writing all this out that he is like a dick through this entire episode but you know what we're just gonna have to go with it because I can't change that now. Early in the episode he moans about how well is a typical girl late 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 to which Cornelia replies Excuse me we're here. I will one day talk about Caleb's early 2000s girls have cooties energy and how his dickheadedness depends on the writer and about how and how a culture that was defined by men are from Mars, women are from Venus, created a battle of the sexes that really just made life worse for everyone. But I'm not getting into that right now. <laughs> Conversation for another day. Later we get this moment. Hmm, not under here. Nothing. Except for the shoe she borrowed last year. Well, she must have hidden it in some fit of girly paranoia. Oh, big words for Mr. Hide a Dagger in my belt. 
Honestly though, as much as Caleb talks a load of shit, Cornelia hits back harder and I love her for that. Before they leave the room, we get this tiny moment where Cornelia like, hugs Caleb's arm? It's kind of random but I guess they're maybe just such close friends by this point that she gives them little hugs or something. I mean, after the mudslugs, like maybe she just likes to hug Caleb? I, I don't know. Besties being besties, I guess. I suppose it says something though that they can go from snarking at each other to being really cute with like minutes. It just kind of shows that their bickering is not really serious. There's no actual animosity there. It's just like friendly rubbing, which is nice. Or at least that's what it is now. There will come a time when their arguments are filled with animosity, but not yet. Later, Caleb decides to be even more idiotic and tries to break a giant boulder with his foot when the Earth Guardian is standing right next to him. Save your foot. Why is this actually one of my favourite episodes? He's such a twat. Like, what? Why do I like this episode so much? Anyway, Cornelia saves Caleb from a trip to the podiatrist and they go into the bunker. And while they're down there, an alarm sounds and Caleb goes to get Cornelia. Not any of the others, just her. And then we get this scene. <gasps> they know we're here. Come with me. Or you could come with me. Once again with the magical light and the sparkles. At the end of the episode, Cornelia is upset since they still haven't managed to rescue Elion and we get this really sweet moment. Guess you're feeling pretty lousy, huh? You've still got us. Uh, yeah. Me too. As long as you don't want to talk about makeup or, you know, girly stuff. Thanks, everybody. I mean, it's the thought that counts. The takeaway here is that he cares about Cornelia and wants to be there for her in the best way he can. He's just... A socially inept loser. The Mulgraves opens with Cornelia heading to the pet shop to buy birdseed for Caleb's raven, which leads to Helen saying this. <sighs> when a girl gets seed for her boy's bird, I call it love. Hmm. Which is kind of hilarious because Cornelia and Caleb aren't dating and Caleb doesn't even realise that Cornelia likes him until later in this very episode. But Helen's already referring to them as being in love. Like, her friends get it, and they do not. Her, like, Cornelia and Caleb are so dumb. All their friends are like, you two know you're in love, right? And Cornelia's like, what are you talking about? Crazy. I don't know what it is about, like, teenagers and these, and anything, where they're always like, they don't want anyone to know, like, who they've got a crush on. And like, I'm pretty sure I was the same, but it's like, see if you never tell anyone, who, see if you never tell the person you've got a crush on that you've got a crush on them, they're never going to go out with you. Like, you're never going to get anywhere if you don't tell people that you like them. Like, that was, I mean, to be fair, that was me and my boyfriend for like three months. And we like had a crush on each other for like three months and didn't say anything. We were just like hanging out. And we're like, eventually one of us had to, it was him, had to be like, just so you know, like, I like you. And I was like, yeah, I like you too. It was like, yeah, why did we not just say this like three months ago? It would have like saved a lot of time. <laughs> so much so, me and my, it's now famous with me and my friends that my boyfriend, when we were still like not together, like asked me to go out for lunch. And like I went out for lunch with him. And then after I left, I was like talking to my friends and they were like, so was it a date? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I shouldn't rep Cornelia and Caleb actually because I'm just as bad. <laughs> Anyway, the plot of this episode sees Cornelia create an acid drop, which is basically a magical clone in the witch universe, to cover for her while she ventures to Meridian alone to speak with Elion and try and convince her to come home. Cornelia leaves the drop with a pile of flashcards to explain her life and tells them not to show the cards to her friends, but since the astral drop has the IQ of a newt, she doesn't follow the advice. Caleb approaches Cornelia in the street to speak to her and we get this scene. Cornelia, great! Do, do you know where I can get more trash can lids? They make great shields. And you are? Wait, wait, wait! K 
Caleb. Real cute boy that you like, but he doesn't know, so don't say anything. Really? Wait a second, you're not Cornelia? Where is she? Caleb obviously realizes at this point that this is not Cornelia and actually her astral drop because the real Cornelia was not going to be kicking around with flashcards about her life and if she's left an astral drop then she must be up to something. But this is also the moment though where Caleb discovers that Cornelia has feelings for him because he's been completely oblivious to this up until now as evidenced by the fact that he goes really when he reads it like he's shocked about it like he never saw that coming. This has to go in the back burner though for now because they have to go and find the real Cornelia because, you know, she's running around in Meridian with no guardian powers on her own. But it's a significant point for their relationship going forward. Cornelia brings the astral drop back to the Silver Dragon basement and the fact that he's holding hands with her is not lost on me. The team goes to Meridian and Caleb goes into the palace in search of Cornelia while the rest of the girls are outside trying to deal with the Mulgriffs. Cornelia and Caleb break out of a window and then use a bedsheet rope like it's a 1960s teen rom-com to climb down the side of the castle. We never actually see the moment where Cornelia and Caleb officially become a couple, but we can assume it happens somewhere between the end of this episode and the start of the next one. And in my mind, I imagine it going something like this. So Caleb asks to talk to Cornelia for a minute and shows her out about going to Meridian alone because it's so dangerous and asks her why she didn't just come to him first and tell him what she was going to do. And she says that, you know, it's because he would have tried to talk her out of it and he says that he wouldn't have. He would have went with her and they could have done something. And Cornelia is surprised that he would do that for her and then it becomes awkward because, you know, there's an awkward silence. So Caleb breaks the silence by saying, so, real cute boy you like, but he doesn't know, so don't say anything. And Cornelia almost dies of embarrassment when she realizes what's happened. But then Caleb tells her that actually it's fine because he feels the same way about her. And since they both like each other, there's no reason for them to not be a couple. And that makes them a couple from then on. That's how I imagine that would have went in, in my head. <laughs> Despite following on directly from the Mulgriffs, we don't get any acknowledgement of the fact that Caleb has discovered Cornelia's feelings or the aftermath of that or, or what happened. Instead, this episode focuses on the discovery that Caleb's father, who has been presumed dead for six months, is actually alive and a prisoner in the underwater mines. Naturally, Team Witch launch a rescue mission. It will come as no surprise that access to the underwater mines is, you know, underwater, which panics Cornelia, who cannot swim and is afraid of water. Irma creates this big bubble to carry them all down into the mines, and Cornelia is terrified of an absolutely massive fish who comes swimming up in the bubble, so she buries her head in Caleb's chest, which is just beyond adorable, if you ask me. And Caleb then tries to comfort her by saying that when he and his dad fished in the lake, they used to throw back things bigger than that, which I don't think was remotely helpful to Cornelia, but, you know, he tried. <laughs> I do think this probably suggests that they are a couple now because they seem to be totally comfortable being cuddly in front of their friends and none of the girls are commenting on it so it seems as if this is them officially a couple now. Later in the episode the team are riding in a minecart for reasons and realise there's no brake so Caleb tries to jam a crowbar into the tracks to slow the cart down but instead he just falls out the front leaving Cornelia and Hale in to cling to him and prevent him getting flattened under the run uh, runaway cart. And then near the end of the episode, Cornelia panics when she realises that Cedric is... Cedric is going after Cedric, according to my script. <laughs> near the end of the episode, Cornelia panics when she realises that Cedric is going after Caleb, so she goes to help. And that's really it for this episode. The plot of this episode is about Blunk coming into possession of the Seal of Phobos, a talisman that can create portals. As such, he has been accidentally opening them all over Heatherfield. Meanwhile in Meridian, Caleb is on the run from Cedric, and the problem is that every time he heads for a portal, it closes in front of him because Will is on Earth trying to seal all the portals that Blunk has been creating with the seal. Ultimately, this leads to Caleb being captured and taken to a workyard in the Hugon Gorge. Cornelia is obviously distressed when she sees this scene reflected in the heart of Canticar and Helen tries to comfort her. But, luckily for them, the Heart of Kandakar can open portals now because it absorbed the Seal of Phobos, so they can head straight through to Meridian and save Caleb. 
and when they do we get this scene which is just so flirty from Cornelia it's unbelievable. <laughs> Hey, stranger. Cornelia, how did you get here so fast? The heart of Kandrakar got sort of an upgrade. Meanwhile, down below, the rebels have started fighting the guards, and Caleb isn't one to miss a punch up, so we get this moment. As much as I'd like to get everyone to safety, there's just something about an unfair fight. <gasps> ah, boys. And that's our first kiss of the series, even if it is on the cheek. Once the gang are back on Earth, they finally manage to open the Book of Secrets, which has been a subplot for the past few episodes, and Krilla and Caleb hold on to each other as they watch Phobos explain his plan to drain Elion's power and turn her into a black rose for all eternity. <laughs> Escape from Cavagor shows us that Cornelia and Caleb entering a romantic relationship has had no effect on how much they can annoy each other. Well, Cornelia, Caleb and Blunk team up to break into Cavagor prison from the Infinite City and we get this moment from our resident lovebirds. Cornelia, you can't push the rock up into the prison. You've got to lower it quietly. Hey, I'm blonde, not dense. I'm just saying. I know. <laughs> Is that quiet enough for you? The quartet then head up into the prison and immediately come face to face with the scuttlers. Caleb tells Cornelia to seal the hole, to which she responds. What? No. But Will tells her to do it, and that's about all we get from this episode in terms of relationship scenes. Cornelia and Caleb do spend most of this episode together because they are teamed up. Uh, well, Tarani, uh, no. Tarani, Irma and Helen are doing something else in a different part of the prison, whereas Will, Cornelia, Caleb and Blunk are specifically looking for um, Elion's birth parents, uh, birth parents, earth parents in the prison. So they're teamed up for the whole episode, but there isn't really anything romantic to talk about here. It's really just them doing their jobs. Caleb also temporarily develops an English accent in this episode, which is just hilarious, and I wish I knew what happened in the recording booth. No brown's here. Are you sure? Try next floor. Greg Sipes, explain yourself, please. <laughs> Caleb's challenge opens with Caleb and Aldarn leading a raid into Phobos's grain store. But it goes wrong and Aldarn and their friends are captured and hypnotised by Elion and Caleb is the only one who manages to escape. So he heads to Earth to get the Guardian's help, which brings us this scene. <laughs> Expecting someone? No. And I'm not allowed to answer when I'm home alone anyway. <gasps> Hello? Someone's trying to break in! Stop! It's Caleb! Uh, 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 uh. What happened? A raid. It went wrong, we broke into the castle for some grain. There were guards, Aldarn and two others were captured. <gasps> We've got to go get them. This is all going to be ruined. Blunk, you ever cook anything? Yes, yes, Blunk clever. You're going to leave the walking stomach in charge of food? Even he can't eat all this. we got to go. Blunk, there's the recipe book. Don't eat the cookies. Or the book. Caleb is completely exhausted and pretty much passes out on Cornelia's shoulder, which I think shows the level of trust and strength of the bond that they have at this point. The fact that he just feels so comfortable to just sort of collapse on top of her. Um, you know, he feels he feels comfortable with her. I think that's really nice. They then head for the portal and along the way, Caleb has an uncharacteristic moment of self-doubt, which Cornelia quickly rectifies. It's all my fault. What kind of leader am I? You're a wonderful leader. You don't know how wonderful you are. <gasps> Extra food for the Meridianites! They are just so sweet. Like, Caleb rarely ever confesses any kind of fear or doubt to anyone, but he does to Cornelia because, you know, he actually trusts her and wants her opinion and wants to talk to her about these things which I, I just think is so nice you know it just shows that they do have such a strong bond that he feels that he can talk to her about about things that he wouldn't normally 
expressed to anyone. And he seems generally surprised by her response, you know? He's just not used to someone caring this much about him, thinking so highly of him, you know? Like, to have someone actually say to him, you know, like, you're a wonderful leader. He's like, wow, like, I, I don't hear that very often. <laughs> Later in the episode, Cornelia is concerned about Caleb when he has to go through the leadership challenge. Good luck, Caleb. I'll be fine, father. The first one back to the arena turns over the hourglass. If the second man arrives before the sand runs out, you battle. <gasps> Are you sure you must do this? Very well. Begin! Uh, he'll be okay, right? No use waiting here worrying. Let's go to the treaty site and try to figure out Phobos' plan. There's another bit in this episode that isn't a scene, but I do want to talk about it, but it needs a bit of explaining. So at one point, Team Witch are sitting in the Hoogon nesting ground discussing what's just happened, and Tarani mentions that Elion must have hypnotized Aldarn, to which Cornelia replies, I bet she doesn't even know she did it. And then later, when Aldarn is broken free of the spell, he says that Elion lied to them, and C Caleb responds with, She probably didn't even know she was doing it. And I just like this because it shows that Caleb trusts Cornelia's judgement and he's echoing her thoughts. You know, he's saying the same thing that she said. He's backing up her assessment of the situation because he, he trusts her judgement. Um, and I just think, I don't know, I think that's really nice. <laughs> The only Cornelia and Caleb moment we get in the Battle of Meridian Plains is uh, the fact that when Caleb lifts up a walkie-talkie to call for the rest of the girls, he says Cornelia's name first. And yes, I am that lame and I'm including it as a moment. It's my video and I make the rules. In this episode, Caleb is on Meridian trying to free the rebels that were captured at the end of the previous episode. And meanwhile on Earth, Cornelia is worried about him and thinks he should be back already, though the others aren't concerned. How'd you do in the science test? Oh, look, I can think about the universe expanding or shrinking or whatever it's doing when Caleb might be in trouble. Cornelia, he's not in trouble. It's just a recon mission. He's done this lots of times. Oh, shouldn't Caleb be back by now? Oh, Caleb, Matt, can you two talk about anything besides your boyfriends? As it turns out though, the mission really has gone wrong and Blunk has been captured, so the girls head to Meridian and quickly find Blunk, as well as an injured guard, which gives us this scene. Help me! Oh yeah, that's gonna happen. Caleb, he's injured! He's a castle guard. Who do you think we're fighting? <coughs> Please, take me with you. Admittedly, Caleb is a little bit short with Cornelia here. Okay, quite a bit short. Cornelia is unfazed though, and this is also one of those scenes we get every now and then where Cornelia functions as a voice of reason for Caleb when he's getting hot-headed. He does the same for her on occasion as well, because these two really are mirrors of each other. On paper, they might not have much in common, but personality-wise, they're both stubborn, hot-headed maniacs with a pride problem, as well as being logical, good strategizers, people who remain calm under pressure, and I am aware that those are two completely polar opposite things, that's a total dichotomy, but that's just how they roll. Later in the episode, Caleb and Blunt get stuck on an evil tree and Cornelia rescues them. Ah! Ah! Where do you think I'm going? Ah! <laughs> Keep your filthy roots off him! You picked the wrong guardian, Bark Boy. Thank you, thank you. Although, uh, Caleb's still Blanc favorite. What's he doing here? Well, Tynara's offered to lead us through the underground mazes to the dungeons. Oh, I bet he has. This becomes a recurring thing throughout the rest of the series. She does not respond well to anyone attacking Caleb and will usually let them know exactly how she feels about it. Caleb's still in a bad mood at this point though, however, and completely walks past Cornelia without thanking her for her help, which I suppose... Okay, no, I'm not defending that. You, you know, you could at least stop and say thank you. That's a dick move, Caleb. 
For context, though, the reason he's so annoyed is because the Guardians have taken pity on this injured guard, Tynar, and want to help him, whereas Caleb doesn't trust him. And considering Caleb is the one who's been living on this hell planet his entire life, being oppressed and assaulted by these guards on a daily basis, it's not exactly surprising that he's not particularly compassionate towards this guy. But he does warm to Tynar, and by season two, Tynar is a valued member of Elion's uh, personal army. Nothing of significance happens in the Stolen Heart for Crowley and Caleb. Uh, that's very much a well in my episode. So we're just going to skip right over to the last episode of season one. The final battle features, unsurprisingly, the Guardian's final battle with Phobos. For season one, at least. But actually, it isn't the battle the team expected. The episode opens with them planning for the battle, which is due to take place later in the week and on Elion's coronation day. To prepare, Will, Cornelia and Caleb head to Meridian and set up a portal before creating a tunnel through a model home. With that in place, the girls can relax for the next few days. Or so they think. I know we haven't eaten here before, but I've got a friend who comes here, so I thought I'd check it out. Caleb! I had this horrible, overpowering feeling. Elion's in huge trouble right now! <gasps> uh, excuse me for a second? Okay, Cornelia, tell me again. Something bad's happening. It was like she was calling to me. Plus, remember Halen's dream? I was Elion, and I was trapped in this huge chair. We have to go! Corny, the last emergency flash you had was that Capri pants were over. We already have an attack plan. Caleb, I've known her all my life. I've always been able to feel when something's wrong. <sighs> okay, let's move. <laughs> I always think this moment is so underappreciated. Like, Helen is there too, but it's Caleb that Cornelia comes running to. And at first, Caleb is reluctant to change the plan that they've already established, but Cornelia pleads with him, reminding the team that she's always been able to tell when something's wrong with Elion. Her whole life, she's always known when Elion's in trouble. So, Will and Caleb agree to move up the attack on Cornelia's say-so, and they all head to Meridian. Caleb trusts Cornelia's instinct enough to tell his entire army that the reason they have to move up the attack is purely based on her feeling. And Vathek questions whether he's wearing love goggles and not being rational, to which Caleb just glares at him and Vathek immediately shuts up. All darn! Vathek, father, we have to move up the attack! To when? To now! Cornelia has a strong feeling the princess is in danger. Caleb, are you sure your feelings for the guardian girl haven't... My men are ready to move. Back in the kitchen of the model home, the rebels all file through into the palace, leaving only Helen, Cornelia and Caleb left in the kitchen. Which gives us the scene where our favourite couple finally share their first on-screen kiss. Good luck, old friend. Go get him! Nice hat, by the way. Well, this is it. The final battle for Meridian has begun. We should go on ahead. If you need me. <laughs> God, I love everything about this scene. Like, Caleb trying to get Helen to leave, Cornelia scowling at her, Helen raising an eyebrow, you know, the surprise and the smile on Caleb's face and the way that she, like, does this little, like, kind of and take a breath before she kisses him and then he's like holding on to her arms and I just I just love it I'm I'm talking about animated teenagers but <laughs> but they they you have to remember they were older than me when I started watching the show you know like they were so much older than me and now I'm so much older than them I hate time <laughs> anyway once they're in the battle, everyone's a bit preoccupied to be having relationship mo moments, but there are a few Cruelly and Caleb bits in there. At one point, Cruelly goes to Caleb to let him know where Elion will be, and then at the end of the battle, once everything's done, Cruelly actually grabs Elion and Caleb's hands and raises them up into the air. It's quite hard to see with the animation because they're very small and distant, but it, it is that is what she's doing. She's holding their hands and raising them up in the air, which is so cute because... Honestly, like, recently more than anything, I've, like, I just love 
the the trio of Cornelia, Caleb, and Elion because like Elion ends up she's Cornelia's best friend, but she ends up one of Caleb's best friends, and they all end up just this little trio. And I just would love to see the three of them just like saving the world together because I just think they're such what a little power trio. It's like Lockwood and Co. <laughs> like Caleb's Lockwood's, Cornelia's Lucy, and Elion's George. <laughs> And then finally, at the very end of the episode, Caleb holds Cornelia's hand whilst they stand in the street watching Elion greet her subjects and talk about how it's finally all over. And that's the end of season one, but don't worry because we have a whole second season to look at and it's about to get so much more complicated. <laughs> that's probably a good place to stop for the end of part one at the end of season one. So this has been season one of Cornelia and Caleb's uh, relationship timeline in the TV show and we will be back very soon with the start of season two where we have six episodes of complete chaos to get through and depending on how long that goes on for when I start reading it that might end up being its own part because there is just so much to go through for the first six episodes of season two in terms of Curly and Caleb. So uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I am really excited for this video to come out because I've worked super hard on it so uh, yeah thank you for being here and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye everyone.